welcome everybody to Read Write Local Unbound. Uh, it's week two of our summer's fantastic series of events. And we have some special guests here from the East and from the West. Uh, we're gonna talk about um, a book that they wrote together called uh, Millennial's Guide to Relationships, as well as meet our guests and find out what makes them tick and what makes them right. So I'd like to introduce, first of all, Dr. Christina Hollett from the East Coast. Hello. And, Hello. Uh, and Dr. Jennifer Wisdom from the West Coast. Hello. Thanks for having us. Oh, thanks for being here. I appreciate this a lot. Hey, um, Dr. Jennifer, aren't you actually bicoastal? <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. It's right I now. She's on the right way. now, I am on the West Coast, but yes, thank you for bringing that up. I am bi-coastal. I live both in Portland, Oregon and New York City. Mm. Okay. And I go over Ohio a lot. Yes. And I fly. Yes. I over, always wait. Over the <laughs> lake, at least, or something. I'm not sure. Always wave. Every time. Yes. Anyway, um, I guess the natural question would be is, how did you meet? But I have a sneaking suspicion that it's something to do with conferences, uh, because you're both uh, uh, you're both psychologists. Is, is that correct? <laughs> you, you are entirely correct on both of those. Okay. So, we, uh, Dr. Jennifer and I were both in something that the American Psychological Association does that is called the Leadership Institute for Women in Psychology, and I think it's in year eleven now. But we were in year four ish. So it could be longer than that. And so I will tell you the truth of what happened. It was, they were long days, full of great information, really wonderful and amazing women psychologists. But you know, I've got just like this much ADHD. So at some point I couldn't stand sitting at the table any longer. And so I saw this woman turned out to be Dr. Jennifer Wisdom, standing in the back. So I sort of walked around and then went and stood next to her, next to her and just sort of said, oh, is this ever going to end? Through a smile and clenched teeth. And immediately she did what she just did. She sort of laughed and said, I know this is really long. <laughs> and from there, our friendship was born. It happens a lot of conferences, doesn't it? Yeah, it was great information. I remember it as I'm just standing there minding my business and Christina comes bouncing up to me like Tigger and says, let's be friends. <laughs> That's what's in my let's head. Play. Like Tigger? <laughs> Tiggers love to bounce. Oh my God. So does Christina. <laughs> she is like a, a, a human Tigger, yes. yes. Well, anyway, we got two psychologists at this conference who have met and now become an inseparable force for good. And... Uh, have you collaborated on things before writing this book for more of a popular audience, like some academic-y type things? Yeah, you know, we... the... go ahead. <laughs> okay, the very first thing we did after that was we did a joint presentation at the next APA convention, which happened to be held in Hawaii, which, oops, you know how that goes. Mm. Um, so we had a really nice time exploring the island and took some a couple days with an additional colleague at the end of the conference to go up to the northern part of the island. Uh, so, yes, we immediately started collaborating <laughs> right away. Great. I wish you mean eating tuna on the north shore of Hawaii. But yes, we learned a lot at the conference, too, and we presented there and then we presented at a couple of other conferences and we wrote a chapter together that Christina, uh, Dr. Hallett, is the first author of on the changing gender norms uh, in multiple professions. So looking at different professions that were either all female, have always been female, all female, like nursing, things, professions that have changed over time from mostly male to mostly female, like psychology and uh, medicine. And then professions that have not really changed too much over time that are still, as we called it, stubbornly resistant to gender integration, like law and STEM. Uh, and we did an analysis of those and it's published in the uh, a handbook of women in psychology or something like that, which is great. Through APA. Yeah. yeah. And then this came in, this came through as well. And I've been bugging Christina that we should write books together. She started writing and she's got what, how many books do you have under your belt now? Four? This is the fourth. Yes, the indeed. One of them. Look, Jerry. Yay. I love it. That was my <laughs> first one. Yes. So the truth is that actually Dr. Wisdom has said, you know, Christina, you are older, 
maybe not wiser, but you're going to come up with good ideas and then I'm going to do them and improve on them. <laughs> because Only you, you have, can guarantee that, Jen. <laughs> yeah. How, how many books do you have, Jen, now? Let's see. You've taken uh, my four and just blown them away. No, no, no. I think we're at, I think we're at six with the Millennials Guide series. Yeah. So got this going. Thank you. So Millennials Guide to Diversity, Equity, mm-hmm. Inclusion just came out. Chris, mm-hmm. Dr. Hallett's holding Millennials Guide to Relationships. Mm-hmm. We started with Millennials Guide to Work um, and then moved to Millennials Guide to Management and Leadership, Millennials and Gen Z Guide to Voting, Millennials Guide to the Construction Trades, and then these two. So I think that's six. And then we've got more coming. Uh, we have Millennials, we're trying a Millennials Quick Guide to being a boss that I'm really excited about in all senses of the word, being a boss. Mm-hmm. And then um, Millennials Guide to Workplace Politics is another one that I'm really looking forward to with another psychologist colleague of mine. And Dr. Hallett and I are also collaborating again. I, I know this is a family program, but I'll go you can <laughs> beat me or, or if you need to, but it's called Millennials Guide to Getting Your Shit Together, which we are so excited about. And it's basically how to, in your 20s and 30s, figure out who you are, what you want to do with your life, how to get through whatever you experienced as a kid and figure out who you are and how to move forward. So really excited about that. That one's scheduled for a fall release. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about why you write. So um, Dr. Christina, have you always been somebody who likes to write uh, or is this something as an outgrowth of your, your practice and your research? Like, you know, had to get the story out, or did you always write? So, there's a couple different answers to that. I will tell you <laughs> that when I was in, must have been junior high school, you know, that was before we had middle school, but mm-hmm. some in this company may remember there being junior high schools. Um, there was a writing contest by the American Lung Association, and it uh, it was just a writing contest, but I wrote a day in the life of a red blood cell <laughs> and I won. <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> I know. I just thought I'd share something. A day great. in the short life of a red blood cell. <laughs> Correct. Right. But I, so. <laughs> right. It sort of explained the, where it came from uh, that. And, you know, and then poetry, because doesn't everyone go through that angsty high school death poetry kind of thing? So maybe not death, but like really angsty high school poetry. I just found some and I shredded them. (laughs) Right. (laughs) You know, I'm like, oh, who wrote this? Oh, that was me. (laughs) I even bound them into a book because, you know, why not? Um, But (laughs) right. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) the short-lived writing career of a high schooler. Um, But truthfully, I've always felt able to write easily and well when I had to do things for, let's say, academic uh, courses or things related to work. But I hadn't actually ever thought of myself as a writer. And that's still, I would say, a transition. So literally four books in, and I'm still trying to get wrap my head around that. I think it's because in some ways, writers in my head include fiction or maybe lean towards fiction. And that, I mean, other than the red blood cell, that I haven't done a lot of fiction, right? I've been, you know, in sort of that personal development thing. But I will tell you one other thing. I did, um, oh, and this is quite a long time ago. I want to say probably a good 15 years ago, at least. I came up with this idea that I wanted to write something and it did come from my practice and the work that I'd done with people. And it was the, the seed of what became own best friend. So I did what all of those would be writers do. I opened a word file and I added to it periodically. And then I actually wrote a couple paragraphs here and there sort of had a chapter outline. This is over the span of years. And I would go back to them like, yeah, I got to get that book done. I'm, I'm going to do that sent out a book proposal, which actually took more work than I had as of yet done, had files of research, which by the time I got to it were massively out of date, and then never pushed go. 
never took it beyond that. And I, I mention this because I know from having spoken to both Dr. Jennifer and many other people that I know who have since written books, that that's one of the things that happens so often. You get this idea and you're really passionate and you work on it, but like you could research forever, you could write forever and it doesn't get done. So uh, a few years ago, actually, the, the secret is after I turned 50, I'm like, I'm going to get all this stuff done. Like, you know, the <laughs> clock is ticking. <laughs> we need to get this in gear. So I got my board certification and said, I'm going to write the first book. And, and by that point, I sat down and looked at the ideas I had, some of which I brought into Own Best Friend, but really reorganized and, and thought about it and just uh, literally sat down and typed chapters of what I would say to clients over the 20 something years that I had been working with them. Right. And what you know. <laughs> right. Right, so, you right. So all of my books, so whether it's on best friend or be awesome or the trauma treatment toolbox for teens or the millennials guide to relationships. For me, they all come from what it means to be a human and a psychologist and a woman who has really spent a lot of time talking to a lot of people and trying to distill that down into things that are accessible. And, and what I want readers to have is the experience of if they're reading, they feel like we're actually having a conversation over a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, this is all very good because uh, a lot of our audience, I'm hoping, is not just people want to read these books, it's people want to write books of their own. And so they're getting uh, some, some uh, insight from you guys as to how you started and what can turn into a book. Not everybody thinks they have a book in them, I suppose, uh, but people have a life in them and maybe from that may come something. Uh, Jen, Dr. Jen, why don't you talk a little bit about, um, about your, how you got into this, the writing thing. Sure, I've been a writer for as long as I can remember. In fact, Christina's story about the blood, red blood cell reminded me of my first book, which was called Keeping Healthy, when I was in like second grade, it's, you know, construction paper and the, the paper with the little dotted lines in the middle. And I wrote a little book, uh, you know, I wouldn't say high quality research, but you know, not too bad for a second grader. I remember apples featured prominently for some reason about an apple a day keeps the doctor away. But in any case, um, that really started my writing career. Uh, and I've been, you know, nerding out around spelling bees and writing and uh, newspaper and different things like that. So after high school, where I was on the newspaper, I went into the military as a photojournalist. So I got to write full time, which was really interesting. Well, journalism and public affairs and various army stuff. But after that, I went to graduate school. So then <laughs> began a long period of time where I'm basically writing scientific articles, but focusing as much as I could on practical stuff and real life stuff. So how to manage research methods in a way that make it easier for you to do the project, not just what you learn in school, but how do you translate those into real world stuff? And uh, I did a lot of qualitative interviewing of patients and providers, uh, healthcare providers about how, how they can communicate better with each other, what patients, what's going on with patients when they're going into healthcare services and how providers can be more responsive to that. And then finally, after 20 years or so, I left academia and, you know, had one of those moments of what do I want to do if I could do anything? Kind of like Christina was talking about with like, all right, here I am. What do I want to do with the rest of my life? And I said, I want to write. So I started writing and um, the millennials guides have been going really well. And I keep hooking Dr. Hallett into more and more of them, which is exciting. We're not going to stop at just two. And then we're also expanding to Gen Z books. Um, and I have one person interested in a baby boomer book. So very excited. Baby boomers guide to the future. So let's see how that turns out. And honestly, most of the people, most of the books have come about because when I say I wrote millennials guide to work, they say, you know what you should write millennials guide to such and such. And I say, at first I would say, Oh, okay, thanks. But then I started saying, great, let's do it. And then people, it like hits that moment that Dr. Hallett was talking about related to, oh, wait, I could be a writer. Like I could do this. Like, yes, you can totally do this. Let's do it. So now I've kind of morphed from being after a few years of writing the books, either as a solo author or a co-author, I'm now in kind of somehow I've become a publisher and editor where I'm helping people write books. And some of them, like the one with Dr. Hallett, we are co-authoring together. 
and then others, I'm not an author on them at all. I'm just the editor and publisher. And this is so much fun. Like who could have imagined as a high school student on, on the newspaper that I'd be a publisher. Holy cow, it's awesome. Well, that's just, that, that is awesome. And I think that you had an idea, a great idea that turned into a bigger one with the Millennials Guides. Now, here's a question some people may have uh, for you, Dr. Jen. Why Millennials? What, where does your interest in helping the Millennial generation come from? Yeah, absolutely. So I am a Generation X. I've never identified as Gen X. Reality Bites is not the story of my generation, or at least not my story. I didn't like that movie. <laughs> I remember being so taken by kind of the ability of these people out there to label my entire generation and to pick such a dumb name like Gen X, which was chosen because they didn't know what to do with this. Like, super lame on that one. So then as I'm moving forward in my career in academia, I am doing a lot of mentoring and training of young people who are, today's young people right now are millennials who are 20 to 40. So kind of no matter how, you know, when I started at between 20 and 40, and now that I am no longer in that age group, the people I was working with stayed in that age group because the graduate students would graduate and new people would come in. So I just have such an affection for that. And then when I would hear all this stuff about millennials, uh, this negative stuff around millennials are entitled and millennials are lazy and all of these things that and honestly, I have not found to be true. I do a podcast as well. And I have yet to interview a single millennial who's only working one job. Everybody's got a hustle. Everybody's moving. Nobody likes to be called millennials. And yet this group is so amazing. Like these people have such technology savvy, they are globally minded, they are diversity, equity, and inclusion focused. It's just absolutely incredible to work with them. So I started looking into what I was going to write and found a whole bunch of books on how Gen Xers like myself and baby boomers can deal with millennials, like how we can handle them, like they're zoo animals or pets or something. And I couldn't find anything for how millennials should deal with us, like anything to help them. And so all of that was happening with the cacophony of, I can't believe a millennial doesn't know how to, whatever, use a rotary phone or something they've never encountered in their life. And I thought millennials need help. Like, <laughs> let's help them instead of putting them down for not knowing stuff. So I'm working with a, what's developed into a fabulous group, an advisory group of millennials that read every single book, provide feedback on everything. And they are so excited to be involved tip if you're working with millennials, involve them. <laughs> no, that's really helpful. So that is really go going well. And then um, I'm started expanding to Gen Z. I had some interns this spring uh, that were working with me on a few projects and they are writing, they're so cute. They're writing the Generation Z Guide to Leaving Home. And it's just, it's adorable. And they are so passionate about it. Like we want to make it easier for people who are leaving home, whether they're going to college or going to the military or going, just moving out or moving across town, there's all kinds of things that we know how to do this because we've done it recently. And I said, great, let's do it. So it's so exciting. And, and I love working with millennials. And as they get older, you know, I might end up shifting a little bit to Gen Z, but I just love working with young people. It's, it's just, it's the best. This is your way of kind of giving back, I guess, in that way. Absolutely. All the, people, books, yeah. Yeah, all the books are subtitled. Most of the books are subtitled. What no one ever told you about how to achieve success and respect or being a great leader or whatever. And this is all the stuff that I wish people had told me. I wish I had known 20 years ago. And even I um, shared the book that Dr. Hallett and I wrote. I gave a copy to my mom, who's a baby boomer. And she was reading it and she said, wow, this is stuff I wish I knew when I was 25. And I thought, yes, we've hit the mark. Yes. <laughs> People hey, and I wanna, yeah. Can I add something into that? Because our subtitle for Millennials Guide to Relationships is happy and healthy relationships are not a myth. And I will say that we've gotten feedback from people of all the different generations on how applicable it is. And from where I was coming from, that was my goal. Right. Because I've worked with people throughout the lifespan. And really, when I think about what's in the Millennials Guide to Relationships, it's sort of relationship advice that's usable, that's at and user friendly. So you can sort of go down the list and be like, oh, here's my problem. What are some action steps that I can take that don't cost seven zillion dollars or take 
500,000 hours, but more, what are things that we can do in the moment to try to make a difference? And clearly, you know, as, as Dr. Jennifer sort of uh, gesturing, right? Because we know that that's one of the things for millennials is like, let's get it done now. But obviously that's for people. It's not just millennials, right? People are like, I, I want to fix for my problem. What do I do? And, and of course we talk about things like, Hey, sometimes, you know, you may want to get some psychological support from a professional or access other specific professional areas of support. It's not about that you have to do everything on your own, but more geared to this idea that, you know what, every single one of us with a little bit of uh, support, suggestion, and direction can take a lot of steps in our own lives to begin to make a difference towards having the kind of life that we want to have. Yeah, I think your subtitle is informative because there's a lot of people who believe that these things are myths, that they're for other people, not for me, you know? And I think that, uh, that a lot of people have thought uh, I, it's aspirational, these other relationship books. It's advice for people who don't really need it because they're doing fine. So what is some of the things that uh, if you could distill uh, for our audience uh, or the podcast or the recording here, what are some of the things that you can bring out from your book as saying some things you could do right now? So there's a there's two foci of the book that I... Dr. Hall and I are absolutely on the same page about. One is practical. It has to be practical. And the second is it has to be empowering. So we don't tell people what kind of relationship they should go for or what they should do in their own relationship. We encourage them to identify their values about what's important to them, identify what they want out of their relationships, help them clarify like how they can communicate what they want with the other person or people and figure out how they can work together or have a relationship with them and then how to deal with any challenges that come up and those and we talk about romantic relationships we also talk a lot about family relationships and roommate relationships and colleague relationships and boundaries about all of them and how to set boundaries with people which in order to set boundaries with people you need to know what you want everything gets back to what you want, <laughs> know what you want to happen, and then what you are and are not willing to do in a relationship with another person. It literally starts, section one, right, is about who are you getting to know yourself, and the first 11 challenges are all about who you are. So we, when we talked about doing this book initially, what we both agreed was you have to have a relationship with yourself and have an idea of what that is, not that it's perfect because there's no such thing, but you've got to have a relationship with yourself to then be able to have relationships with everybody else to some degree. And so that's how the book is formatted. And in, uh, Jerry, I know you're familiar with this, but if anyone's listening who isn't, instead of chapters, we have challenges. So there's a section like, who are you getting to know yourself? And then challenge one through 11. And each of the challenges is uh, geared so that you can literally look through the table of contents and go, oh, that's an issue for me, or I, maybe that would help right now. So if I look randomly under getting to know yourself, challenge five is engaging in self-care or um, <laughs> challenge nine is the dark side of social media. It's not about the likes. And so for each challenge, what we do is there's a little introductory paragraph or so that sort of sets the scene for what we're going to talk about. And then there's specific steps of things that you can look at. So if I flip to, randomly enough, page 33, under uh, the dark side of social media, <laughs> the first step, right, in looking at this is social media can be problematic. Now, I mention this because one of the biggest things that I see in my clinical practice, but you'll just see if you talk to your friends about stuff on social media, is that social media is curated. And often we treat social media as if it's just a quick snapshot of real life. And it isn't. It, it can't be. I mean, it, they may be legitimate. Let's say, like, I don't use filters or anything, right? So if you looked on my social media, you would see actual live pictures of the stuff I've shared but it's only what I've shared. It has nothing to do with all the rest of the time. Like the times when, you know, I didn't shower, I look really crappy or my hair is like sticking up even weirder than it is now, right? There are things that we choose to share with other people. 
And sometimes people share things that are about their personal struggles or vulnerabilities, but it's still a choice to share. And so when I, we thought about that chapter for me, that was one of the practical things that I wanted to people to really frame social media in is like a hundred percent of whatever's on there by anyone has been chosen and may well be Photoshop filtered, Canva, you named it. Otherwise not real. <laughs> right. Yeah. And one of my favorite chapters, uh, I should, I, I should mention. So Christine has been married for a long time and I am single. So we each have different unique perspectives on relationships uh, based on our own experiences and on how, where we are right now. So uh, Christina said, hey, can you write some of these chapters that you might know more about than me? And she gave me this chapters on breakups and sex. So thank you for that. So I had now have under my belt a chapter on basically getting busy during a pandemic. And part of what we talk about is Again, knowing yourself and what you're comfortable with. Are you comfortable with masks, without masks, with kind of how do you have a conversation about safe sex pre-COVID? And then how do you talk about it during COVID? What about um, being in someone else's house or longer term relationships with people? What is, what is comfortable for you and what do you want? And are you looking for a relationship? Or are you looking for a hookup? Or are you looking for something else? when you figure out more about what you want and what your boundaries are, then we can talk about, then we go into how do you have that conversation with someone? So back when this was written, it was a question of don't, don't be with anyone you don't already live with unless you're wearing a mask. So that could be an awkward conversation about meeting someone and wanting to be romantic and not wanting to take your mask off. So that's weird. And how do you have that conversation? Well, now it's not as weird anymore as it used to be, but for many people, it's a difficult or an awkward conversation. So how do you have that? And again, if, if you didn't care about wearing a mask, then skip that one. You don't have to worry about it. Maybe the other person does, and then you need to have a conversation. But figuring out what you need, what they need, how to have a conversation with it. That's like the book in a nutshell. <laughs> right. Pretty much conversation, yeah. boundaries and conversation. But uh, let me share one other little example, because in case anyone's interested, this also relates to our lives together, Dr. Jen and I. Uh, so there's a whole section on roommates, dealing with roommates, but one is on traveling together. Like we've got other chapters on politics in romantic relationships and politics at work or in family or in roommates. So there's all sorts of different things, but like the traveling together is an example that really came from uh, some of our own experience. We've traveled We've actually traveled fairly extensively together, including, okay, let's see if I can get this right, Jen. We have traveled together to Peru, to Italy, to Croatia, and to, uh, where was the border place? I don't know. The little town between Croatia and Italy, the yeah. <laughs> little so, country. Anyway, yes. yes, as well as throughout the United States. So, um I think that's it. But so as you can see, we traveled a lot um, there. Oh, no. Uh, and Mexico. And right. Mexico. Yeah. So we have really traveled a lot and uh, learned sort of what it means to be a good travel partner and what it doesn't mean. <laughs> right. And I will say from a practical perspective, again, um, being able to communicate honestly, saying what's really important to you, what's really important to me? How do we work these things out? And and I'll use a, a small example from when Jen and I were in Italy together, um, because the whole idea of driving in Italy like was not my thing. And she's like, "Get your driver's license internationally, and we can share the driving." And I was like, uh. "So as it got closer and closer, I'm like, I'm real. I am happy to navigate." I'll pay more for gas. I will virtually do anything. I will talk and keep you awake. I will guard the car if you need to take a nap. I'll do anything instead of driving. And that, of course, was not what Dr. Jennifer was initially hoping for in her traveling companion. Take it away, Dr. Jen. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting. So, yeah, I drove like a thousand miles by myself. Not by myself, but I was the only driver. Christina was next to me. And, you know, sometimes things get a little sticky when you're trying to navigate in a country where you don't know your way and you don't understand the road signs, including the language. Do not enter. 
anyway, so it, we had some adventures and we were able to take that, those experiences from our travels together as friends. We each have traveled with partners or spouses. We each have had roommates. We each have had a lot of these experiences that people often aren't aware of how to handle them. So for example, I was talking with a friend of mine who's around 25. She's the daughter of a friend that's my age. And she was saying, I'm having such a problem with my roommate because they make a mess and don't clean up the apartment. And then when I get home from being out of town, I have to clean up everything. Common issue. This happens a lot. They have different standards of cleanliness and what clean means. And then of course, if she's cleaning up after them, you know, how do you manage, manage that? And so when I talked to her with some of the stuff that was in the book, she was like, oh, I didn't know I could just tell them this is the deal. Or instead of cleaning up after them, if I just push everything over to their side of the apartment, I don't have to be the person, I don't have to be the mom in the situation. You know, I'm not their mom, I'm a roommate. We all should keep it clean. I can have a conversation with them about what our standards are, those kinds of things where it seemed un, uh, impossible before we started talking about it. And then once we started talking about it, she's like, oh yeah, I can do this. Oh, that would make my life so much less stressful. That's what, what the book is for. That's what all of the millennials guides and Christina's, uh, Dr. Howard's books as well. They're to help make people's lives easier and happier. What I Quickly. Can what I can see as a common theme here in, in your books and, and Dr. Health books is a lot of it is about having difficult conversations with people. In many ways, the most important thing is to establish boundaries so you know where you stand with different things. Because a lot of people, when there's no boundaries, it's like a cell wall um, right. or maybe a paper. Everything goes through. It's, it's not just semi-permeable. There's no wall. Or there's right. a brick wall. There's got to be something in between. And right. I think it's been very helpful to look at these. Plus, also, these books, the Millennials Guides, are... are you don't not supposed to read them straight through. You could, but one section could lead to another and you can have your own, choose your own adventure through the things that really matter to you, right? That's right. Mm. That's right. Go to whatever, you know, even our, even our books don't have rules. You can read it in whatever order you want. We, the whole goal is for it to be helpful for you. So read whatever you want. Okay. You know, I'll, can I also tell you that I have said several married couples who like one spouse was an early reader and then they asked their other spouse to read the book who are millennials. And some of the interesting feedback I got from them was that they were initially tempted to skip some chapters because they're like, that's not an issue. And then having read the ones that they thought that's how they did it, they like read ones that seem most relevant first and then went back. And then they're like, wow, there was actually stuff that could still enhance our relationship or help us learn or grow, even though it's not a problem. So that's another piece that I think is pretty cool is you don't have to be at like everything is about to explode or implode to be able to benefit from it. Because our perspective is a little bit of self-reflection, a little bit of boundaries, a little bit of conversation, and a little bit of ideas of stuff you may not have known or considered all together is a recipe for just actually making things better in the moment. Yeah, I think it's like you can fill in your own dance card at your own speed. And also, like you said, sometimes it's better to be prepared for some things before they happen. Uh, because well, I didn't think about that, but I've read about it now. So I think I'm ready for it. So I'm um, thank you guys for helping not only solve problems, but prepare people, not just for problems, but for good things to happen in relationships. Mm -hmm. Now, I guess we're probably going to wrap this up shortly. Uh, so I just wanted to say um, that coming up in future weeks for our rather small audience, we have um, Saturday, we've got uh, Jeffrey Simpson, who's from Avon Lake, but lives in Germany. And he wrote a novel about uh, a runner in 20, 2061, Cleveland, who is competing against genetically enhanced people, but he's not, and he's going to win anyway. So that's kind of neat. Wow. And then Avon Lake's own Ian Lewis, not his real name, but you know, he's got these uh, series, the, the Driver series and uh, the Reeve series, set in very weird worlds, a bit like ours, but not really. And I've been really getting into these, got like three or four books in each series. So those are the things coming up Saturday and next Tuesday. So in order to wrap this up, I'd just like to say, Thank you, Dr. Kristen, Dr. Jen, for sharing your, I would say wisdom, but that's just one of you, um, your expertise, your experience, and your problem-solving abilities with the world. So with that, have a good evening, everybody. Um, 
and uh, just tune in and and uh, Dr. Jen and Dr. Kristen, keep doing what you're doing. And thank you for being our guests tonight.